This summer, Rosalind Carter addressed the National Urban League, perhaps the best financed, most efficient civil rights organization today. Its black members, for the most part, help make up the much talked about black middle class, successful lawyers, doctors, and administrators. Equal employment is being enforced. We have a strong, dynamic woman in charge. Her name is Eleanor Holmes Norton. She happens to be black. A reception following the First Lady's address. But this scene could take place in any number of U.S. cities today as thousands of blacks have entered a middle and upper middle class status. They've obtained higher educations and top paying jobs. But not without controversy, Supreme Court rulings and mass demonstrations. This is not a scene from the 50s or 60s. The Ku Klux Klan is experiencing a resurgence in this country. Their theme today, not much different from the past years. Black gains have come at the expense of whites. The government is giving the white people's jobs to the blacks. What do you mean the white people's jobs? Well... Shouldn't anybody be entitled to work? That's right. Anybody should be entitled to work. But an employer should be entitled to give that job to the most qualified man. The government now tells the employers, you must hire X percent Negroes, you must promote X percent Negroes, you must not give tests to test the qualifications, you must give it by these quotas. I think the only reason why whites are making these kinds of statements is because they want to see, quote, reverse discrimination. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, blacks have never stopped fighting the Civil War. And when you have things like the Bakke case and affirmative action attacks and all that thing, it's the same things as taking up guns that you had in the Civil War. So I just count all of that as being pure racism. Opportunities are shrinking. At the same time, competition is increasing. And if you have diminishing opportunities on the one hand and increased competition on the other hand, all you can have is incredible conflict. All right. <clears throat> For every one black who earns a middle income today, nine blacks earn below average wages. The majority of blacks still have make up the welfare and unemployment roles. They occupy 30% of the nation's substandard housing. Many of the adults never complete high school. Their children graduate from school unable to read at the 12th grade level. If political participation can be used as a gauge, most blacks see little hope that their plight will ever be changed. It is written, Manifest. that all men are brothers. Prophecy. We come like blood brothers. Moon is born. Cause blood is thicker than water. A and light. From the misty ground, from the unknown, the shadows, the deep, the darkness, the triple dark, the grave, the I grew up in the violent island of Shaolin, 55 moments, 6, 4, 10, 4, when Jack Pot Watt was hot, I was not, a rusty ass child with tears and snots, acquired the knowledge, how to master my thoughts, my skinny frail body couldn't fuck with the sports, 6 feet 2, still whack on the court, so I stalked New York with a black pitch fork, my style date back to 90 watt, cutting box, wallaby clocks with no socks, remember the days before your pants were sad, quarter week is on the block, just throwing up tags, I was born with a rusty spoon as a mouthpiece, life was hard that the graves was my company, and when my prophets in trouble predicted, to cross the path as I laugh at the victim, the war was short, the fence was spent average, watching devils fiend like a savage, blood brothers need me call, in a minute, a minute, go space and all check it, with a grim in the undertake, devils get baked, I sniff your ass like an ape, torches to scream, building up my steam, death to us apart, rushes through the bloodstream, yo something made right, I don't I feel a vibe, blood brothers, are you with it? If I have to choose one or the other Back the fuck up, spook, yo, that's my blood brother All, all, all in together Blood brothers, all in together All, all, all in together Blood brothers, all in together All, all, all in together Blood brothers, all in together All, all, all in together Blood brothers Back in the days of Lee's and BVD's I grew up deceived by wicked and in the era, where well, you can't even trust the man in the mirror. Now grave digging niggas receive my trust. I'm like Christ. We walk among the thieves in the sluts. I bring stress like skins on PMS. The streets are bloody mess. There ain't no EMS in sight. My thoughts are to leave the slums. I hustle with beats and drums, not keys and guns. My feet are numb as I walk my dogs. I cut off the floors with the grave digger swords. Life parole, he's being my men is violated. Hookers are new, it is faded. Snakes are decapitated and castrated. 
faded Niggas this lost, your whole walk is being raided Shows today are hectic, niggas are wreck shit Look for frowns and jet quick This piece is getting heated, balls are rushed and stampeded Devils are all defeated by the blood brothers Create in us now, O oh Lord, clean hearts, as we are sincere in our love for this community and sincere about what we will do to make it a better place for all of us to live. Fifteen years ago, if I told these people that one day they would be discussing together the welfare of their community, I would have been laughed at by the blacks and probably run out of town by the whites. While in Selma, Alabama recently, we were invited to a meeting of the Selma, Dallas County Biracial Committee. What is this new South? Have racial attitudes down here changed? Yes, they have. In other words, I'm sure you saw where Governor Wallace made the statement that uh, where he hollered uh, segregation forever and white supremacy for the first two uh, terms that he served, that he made a mistake. Selma has changed considerably since the mid-60s when the town was segregated. And what happened here in 1965 helped change the rest of the country as well. Civil rights marchers protesting poll taxes, literacy tests, and other barriers to the ballot box took to the streets in a march toward Montgomery. Mounted state troopers attacked the crowd in a bloody assault that was witnessed by millions of Americans via television. Violence inflicted upon the nonviolent group moved President Lyndon Johnson to sign a voting rights bill which guaranteed that no ballot box would be closed to blacks in the future. They came in darkness and they came in chains. And today, we strike away the last major shackle of those fierce and ancient bonds. Two million blacks have been added to the voting rolls in the South since the Voting Rights Act became law. Today in Selma and Dallas County, there are 14,000 registered black voters. Four blacks each have been elected to the Selma School Board and City Council. The white man was satisfied at one point that the blacks were satisfied with his condition. Now he knows that uh, the black man is not. The election of black officials is the major reason why all the streets in Selma's black communities are paved today. New homes replace shacks, and every house has indoor plumbing and access to the city's sewer system. None of this was so in 65. Those people who are involved in attempting to uh, bring industry to the South, who recognize the fact that the only way that we're going to raise ourselves up by our bootstraps is to build a good tax base and to get people off of welfare rolls, uh, to get people involved in workable uh, jobs where they can uh, contribute to the economy of the section. Uh, this is what the New South really means to me, is the fact that we're beginning to get industry in here, and we're being able to take our uh, big pool of unskilled yet trainable labor, much of, put it black. To, much of it black, and put them to work in worthwhile endeavors. Just outside of Selma, small ways up the tracks lies a small black community of some 10 to 12,000 people. It's called Selmont. And the people here in Selmont say they haven't seen any changes in the past 10 to 12 years. Black voter turnout here is low, the same for the rest of Dallas County. The five members on the county commission are all white, even though blacks make up half of the Dallas County population. The residents of Selmont don't complain about their dirt roads, inadequate housing, or lack of proper sewage. Before 76, you didn't have indoor bathrooms, no indoor water. You had to come out here to this faucet. No, that wasn't even there. All that was just about put here near that the same time. That wasn't even there either. We had a hand pump. It's that old pump you see out there. It was a hand pump. You have a public park out here? Not if I know. Uh, probably if it's in the school. In the school. Do you have any playgrounds? That, no. If we do, they far away in our town. They're far away. 
So what do you do for fun, recreation around here? We just sit, 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 sit down, play cards. Play cards? Because yeah. it, it ain't nothing. Were you in the march? There are enough voters in Selmon to place one and possibly two blacks on the Dallas County Commission, a move that would assure the community of a bigger share of the county's budget and services. But if the poll tax and literacy test were major shackles in 65, apathy has to be the major shackle for Selmont's blacks today. The people just don't care. They actually just do not care. See what I'm saying? They find one person going to stand up on they say, well, Mr. Crumb is doing no handling it. Well, where's Mr. Crumb's support? If you go to the city council meeting with three people, that's one thing. But suppose you go in there with 25 people. That makes the city council commission look at you a whole lot different. There are no blacks on the commission. And therefore, uh, the needs of uh, that community have gone, uh, you know, lacking in many uh, ways because of the lack of effective representation on the uh, on the commission. Is it fair to say you have your hands full right here in Selma? Definitely. Right here in Selma. That's not a part of the city limits. You were saying that you're concerned that a lot of black people can't pull together. Kill what you try to do. Regardless to how it benefit and regardless to how it does. They just won't just won't be concerned with one another. Like the sure. It's been almost 15 years since the Voting Rights Act was passed, but in some cities today, local law still prohibits blacks and other minorities from participating fully in the political process. Two cities come to mind, Houston, Texas, and Cambridge, Maryland. They live in horse stables and chicken coops converted into slum housing. When it rains, the water trickles through the roofs and from under the floorboards, causing floods inside the apartments. The streets have no gutters, curbs, or sidewalks. This is Cambridge, Maryland, segregated Ward 2, home for most of the town's 4,300 blacks. This house back here has a condemned sign on it, and there are people living in it. A lot of people are scared to even open their mouth. You notice a lot of people won't even talk to you while you're in this town? Yeah. You know why? Because if they talk and say too much, the landlord is going to threaten them with eviction. Cambridge doesn't enforce its housing code because it employs only one full-time housing inspector. The rundown properties are seldom torn down because Cambridge doesn't have a relocation program for its residents. It all makes for a bonanza for the landlords who live in the city's segregated white neighborhoods. How come all of the black people live in the second ward? Well, that's, that's been ever since I was a boy. I don't, I don't know anything. Yeah, why is that? Well, I, I imagine it was their preference. If the blacks in this ward could afford it and wanted to move, say, in your neighborhood, would they have any problems getting a house? Well, I can't say. They haven't tried very much. I can't say that, but I don't think so. Uh, most of the people here are broad-minded, and and uh, it's how you carry yourself. Now, it's, it's, a, it, it's a process that uh, I think it'll take time, but it takes a person like you. It, uh, you talk nice, you approach a man nice, and you're treated nice. I can move into your yes, neighborhood. Yes, sir. Absolutely. But most of these people here could not. I don't say that. I have one full-time housing inspector on the job and have had. We've had two full-time on until just two weeks ago when one left to go back to college. We will be hiring another one within two weeks. That gives me two full-time housing inspectors. I really need three full-time housing inspectors. These housing inspectors are... Cracking down on the landlords, the slum landlords, as the blacks call them. If you will check those homes out and who owns them, I think you will find that uh, most of them are owned by slum landlords and not individuals. The water goes up under the house when it rains. Yeah, but see, you can't have to put your towel in, man. Well, he don't, he don't do anything about that. Well, where does the water go when it rains? Well, like I say, it's oh, a matter right of drainage. Down. It goes in the ground and it goes off in the street, like I told you. It goes up under these houses, too, right? Well, it may, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. low down here. Are you going you gonna to do anything about that? Well, I don't think we can do anything until we get more drainage. Really? I don't know. No, are you, you suggesting? Are you talking to uh, the city council, the mayor, about getting uh, drainage out here? Curbs? 
No, I haven't. No, you know, I don't get involved. I, but these you know, are your, we'll these are your properties, right. and you haven't talked to the no. city council or the mayor about getting better drainage out no. here. No, no, I haven't. Miss Jackson, hi. Right, can I come in? Seventy-four-year-old Goldie Mae Jackson has lived in Cambridge's second ward all of her life. For her and the rest of the people here, the integration process is long overdue. Little has changed in the 15 years since the town became a national symbol of racial repression. In 1963, the National Guard occupied Cambridge for almost a year after the civil rights demonstrations erupted into violence. Today, at least one black leader, Sarah Nichols, is prepared to take to the streets again. I really am, because uh, it doesn't seem that we can get anything done by just working through the system here. And all they can tell you is it takes time. And I know back in the 60s when we did take to the streets, this is the only time that we were noticed and the people knew that we meant what we said when we want what rightfully belongs to us. Lemuel Chester remembers the demonstrations of the 60s all too well. He was arrested dozens of times along with militant H. Rap Brown. Today, Chester is part of the system he once sought to tear down. He runs a self-help community center funded with federal government dollars. Should you decide to take to the streets and organize, what are the chances that you'll lose this program you're running? <laughs> the chances are, 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 are quite high that I would lose my job and the uh, program, but I still Would you have be willing to take that risk? To lose Honestly. my job? To lose my job? Yeah. Well, I, no, I, <laughs> I have to live, too. They don't want to break down their image as far as that white man is concerned, but it doesn't make any difference to me. You think Mr. Chester and people like him are more interested in their image? Yes, I certainly do. As far as the jail bit is concerned, I think I've paid my dues, and I don't think that I can be as effective uh, incarcerated in, uh, in a jail. I just don't think I can be effective. If blacks in Cambridge are hesitant to march again, they're even more apathetic about voting. But if every black in Cambridge did vote, under present law, they could not elect more than one member to council, even though they make up more than a third of the city's population. You see, council members are elected by ward. And as we've already pointed out, blacks are segregated in Ward 2. Now, in the communities on the eastern shore, where everyone runs at large, there is zero representation of blacks on the city council. So you're telling me it's better to have one representative than none? You're in a no-win position so often. Now, I think if blacks were more participant in the, main, in the, in the act, political activity, that we would have a little better clout. If you have an expertise up in Washington, send it down to us, because we'd like to try what you think is worth best. We need to find out ways to get our people interested in it, because this is the thing. And unless we do it in Cambridge, unless we do it in Baltimore, Washington, all over the country, I think we're in trouble as blacks. In the vernacular of the community from whence I've come, we've kicked City Hall's ass. <laughs> It may be difficult to understand, but these people are celebrating after an election in which their side lost. We can run those rascals out in the... To explain this phenomenon, we have to add some history. Houston, Texas is the country's fifth largest city. Blacks and Hispanics make up 40% of its population, but they've been able to elect only one minority to city council. When we have a petition of local Houston people, Black and Hispanic candidates are simply unable to collect white votes under a system whereby all candidates are elected at large. There is no district representation. The minority vote is further weakened because the present council consistently uses its authority to annex all white suburban jurisdictions. Our annexations, uh, in all fairness to the city, is not done to dilute the minority vote. It's done to expand the tax base. We have been outnumbered and therefore uh, without uh, or with little result in terms of uh, more representation on city council. The U.S. Justice Department was eventually brought into the case. The city of Houston was told that by diluting the voting strength of minorities, it was in violation of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Justice officials ordered the city to come up with a plan that would guarantee black and brown representation on city council. We can run our own business a whole lot better than the Justice Department can. And uh, uh, they, uh, 
they have stepped in. There's no question about that. But now I think they're going to get out of our kitchen and we can fry the fish we need to fry. The city council eventually agreed on a plan that would increase the number of legislators to 14. Nine of the members would be elected from districts, five at large. Black and Hispanics wanted even more districts, 16 in all. They formed a unique coalition to defeat the 9-5 plan. What? No. When we sat down at the same table and looked at what each of us got, you know, instead of saying you're getting all of the, all, all the stuff or we're getting all the stuff or we ain't getting nothing, we find out ain't either one of us getting a damn thing. Bigger government has never brought better government. Just look around at the bigger cities. It was a contest of minorities against City Hall and local businesses, with the latter spending thousands of dollars on television commercials. Blacks and Hispanics couldn't match the business community's dollars, so they relied on personal contacts and a 24-hour phone bank. You're going to vote against it. Thank you very kindly. Try to turn out the vote in the afternoon. On the day of the election, Hispanic and black leaders showed no signs of letting up while the confident opposition was nowhere to be found. Minorities canvassed the polling places, hoping to win over undecided voters. After all, to date, it was the ultimate test of the minority's ability to organize, their ability to flex some political muscle. If we uh, win the battle in defeating the plan that has been put on the, the ballot by the city council, uh, we will be able to negotiate with the city for a larger uh, number of single-member districts which would allow for greater representation on the part of blacks and Hispanics. We're from out of town. You're going to vote today? Uh, vote. Vote. Vote for who? Think important? Could be. You're not that concerned about it? Not really because I don't know that much about it. Yeah, I will vote, you know. Where'd they go vote at? Right over there, right across the street. Oh, right across the street, over there. Both sides have predicted a low voter turnout, but no one inaccurately assessed the apathy on the part of blacks and Hispanics. After the ballots were counted, it was clear that low-income minorities had little, if any, interest in Houston's political process. Less than 6% of the low-income registered blacks and Hispanics voted. The 9-5 plan was approved by a 2-to-1 margin. I really believe that, that our people are just as concerned about participating in government as anybody else in this country, given an equal and a fair opportunity to participate. The black community is disillusioned with the system itself. They've been promised so many things from the politicians, and the politicians have never delivered. You know, it's incumbent upon me and, and the rest of the people who are deemed as leaders of our community to try to excite the, the black community to, to, to affect their interest again. We're going to run those rascals out. We're going to put together some people who can beat those guys whether we got the money or not to do it because this coalition can do it. Last week under court order, the city of Cleveland began busing some 93,000 students in an effort to integrate its schools. For many of the students, it was the first venture across town. Cleveland is segregated for the most part, but the blacks on the city's east side, the whites on the west. Just outside of Cleveland, in the upper middle class suburb of Shaker Heights, 6,000 black and white children are preparing to enter the 10th year of a voluntary desegregation plan. I think I could say that the Board of Education and our superintendent are committed to equal education for all children. And equal education means that black children and white children go to school together. Beverly Mason is coordinator of the Shaker Heights busing program. She, like many of the blacks now living in Shaker Heights, is a native of Cleveland, a product of the Cleveland public school system. Right now, the, as far as the, the school system in Cleveland, it's in turmoil. It's in the throes of a court-ordered busing, uh, court-ordered desegregation. It's also financially and has, has, is in great difficulty. If your children were still school age and you lived in the city of Cleveland, would you send them to public school? That's a, that's a difficult question um, because, uh, you know, naturally I have some feeling for the city of Cleveland, though I don't live there. But I have to be honest. It would be very difficult for me to send my children to Cleveland schools right at this point as they are today. Thousands of Cleveland blacks joined the white flight to the suburbs after racial barriers were lifted in the mid-60s. 
They abandoned not only a poorly funded, ill-equipped school system, but decaying neighborhoods begging for new housing and jobs. We gambling, man. So Unemployment among young black males here is 42 percent. Now I count about 22 votes here. Do all you people vote? Go to the polls. When's the last time you went to the polls to cast a ballot? In '74. '74. Yeah. Why did you stay away so long? I don't like the politicians that's running. They ain't doing nothing for me. In these communities, apathy has replaced the optimism which existed in Cleveland for blacks in 1967. That year, 75% of the registered blacks went to the polls to elect Carl Stokes, the city's first black mayor. Stokes decided not to seek a second term, and blacks haven't voted in impressive numbers since then. He voted when Stokes ran. Uh, because he he pricked their sensitivity. He made them want to get out in their own self-interest. And, and I think they will again when a candidate comes along, black candidate comes along, and pricks their interest. That deals not with getting over, but survival. The point that we're trying to get across to black people is that you've got to participate. And the only way that you can participate is not by raising hell and not by standing on the corner raising a stick and say, get whitey. You participate by having the power to vote, to put men in office that will see to it that that changes it make. How your bad brothers doing? They doing right too? As far as I know. Dr. Winston Ritchie, a native of Cleveland and a veteran of the city's civil rights movement. Today, the well-renowned dentist lives in Shaker Heights and is chairman of the Shaker Heights City Council Finance Committee. Shaker is a kind of community where there's, there's money enough and, and brains enough and, and everything, desire enough to do anything it wants to do. I'm, the Richies and other Shaker Heights residents are determined to maintain the racial composition of the city. That is 20% black, 80% white. This is the primary function of the Shaker Heights Housing Department. Are you discouraging blacks from moving into Shaker Heights at this point in time? Unfortunately, there is an element of that no matter how you cut it. That's a tremendous moral problem that some of us have wrestled with. Um, and the only way we can justify the continuation of that kind of activity is the fact that the end perhaps justifies the means. And I believe in integration. I believe in it. If you want to live near white people, find it's your business. But you don't have the right to tell me that I can't move in. And it, it's a tragedy. And it's, um, it's part of that middle class white syndrome that blacks have forgotten their roots and want to be uh, around white people to the detriment of other blacks. You try hard not to say that, and you don't want to say that, but I think you have to face the realization that if, if the normal real estate practices uh, prevail, uh, Shaker probably would be, um, would have a higher percentage of blacks now than it has presently. You buy the theory that blacks move in, whites move out, property values go down, schools go down, I think city services are poor. Historically, that's... Uh, that's, that could be uh, substantiated, I'm sure you know that. So we find that we're not dealing with a race situation, we're dealing with a class situation. These are the same black folks who were working uh, in Republic Steel and they were in college and, and places like this. And in the 60s when Stokes became mayor of this town and Martin Luther King marched and so you got to open up colleges. You got to get rid of the quarter system in the med schools so that we can have young black doctors, young black lawyers, engineers. Those people out there now who want to live in a restricted neighborhood are the ones who were the beneficiaries of the marches that was done by the young black militants, those that went to Selma and places, he, and even here in Cleveland, to open up jobs. They could use your leadership now, your stamina now. How, how do you respond to that? Absolutely. I agree with you totally. We joined the white church. We were the first members of the largest white church in the state of Ohio. And uh, we left the black inner city church where we were, um, where I was um, an elder. And I went to the minister and I said, uh, I said, I have the opportunity. Now, I know if, if people like me leave, it's going to leave a big hole in your church. At the same time, if somebody doesn't go out there to this church, uh, that job isn't going to be done. You know, and what should I do? And um, I guess the response was, uh, you do what you think you have to do. No, no one begrudges <clears throat> these people their right to live in, in, in these kind of surroundings. No one begrudges that. I, I look forward to it, and I, I wish them well. But if, if the black movement is to succeed, you need the brains, you need the help, you need the money, you need the participation of all blacks. What prevents 
the blacks in Shaker Heights from sharing with the blacks in Cleveland. When you say sharing, you mean lending some expertise to the city sure. of uh, mm -hmm. Cleveland? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess I guess there might be a time constraint there. I think, uh, uh, you know, when you're trying to raise four kids and and do all you can to keep this community going, uh, all of a sudden you, you have to play a little golf and maybe a little tennis to keep yourself, uh, you know, from going crazy. Mm -hmm. And I think you... If you want to commit yourself and devote yourself, I think you could do some good in the city of Cleveland. Um, I think many, I think many, um, many, many of the blacks that that live um, and in Shaker and have have some ties with the city. I don't think it's a total abandonment of of the city of Cleveland. Um, I think many of us are willing to share our expertise with the people that live in the city of Cleveland. We serve on boards. We volunteer. Many of us work. Many of the, the um, parents of Shaker children are, are teachers in the city of Cleveland. The city of Cleveland's problems are so horrendous that even if all of us that live, all of the blacks that live in Shaker devoted half of our time, waking hours to the problems, and I'm not sure <laughs> how much a dent we'd make. I'm here to tell you that we better wake up in America and face the fact that even though in Philadelphia we've got a six million dollar bionic basketball player named Dr. J, black folks are still disproportionately unemployed, even though they make up a little over 10% of this country's population, they live in over 30% of the substandard housing. In May, 12 black members of Congress went to Birmingham, Alabama for the beginning of a nationwide effort to rally black voters. We better wake up, black America. 2,500 people from at least four southern states were expected at the weekend conference. Less than half that number actually showed up. Fifteen years ago, black leaders were able to fill the streets of Birmingham with men, women, and children willing to face hoses and policemen's clubs for the right to vote and sit in public facilities alongside whites. The problem is that a number of people who were part of the movement uh, just wore out. Uh, they gave their lives to it and they're worn out. That's one category. There's another category who participated in the movement, saw us come up with civil rights legislation, but have not seen their lives substantially changed and they've become frustrated. There may be a widening gap between black leaders and the black masses. This was further explored in Chicago, where we attended two social gatherings. One, an upper middle class affair thrown by the Carter Mondale Campaign Committee for the National Urban League staff. The second party was held blocks away in a low income neighborhood on Chicago's south side. This is the Jackson family, and they're celebrating a birthday. I don't see too much politicians are doing it all really far, far as the common man is concerned. How can the black do anything that's knocking them back, politicians? Well, well, let me get that. Come here, come here. Don't run. Come here. Knocking them out of it. What are you saying? How can they do? How can the black do anything and politicians every time they get up there, somebody knocking them back out of it? The black people, in my opinion, are still shackled with the mentality of the slave, slave master, expecting something to be given to them. A power is not given, it's taken. And the only way it's going to be taken in the political process in America is through the political process. I have no faith in, uh, really, the politicians. No leaders. Do you have faith in anybody? No. The only person I really have faith in right now is me. All I can hear is what they criticize and what the president is not doing. And I, you know, I don't believe in programs where we got to wait for the government to do something for us. We have to do it for ourselves. Don't lay down my burden, down. Come on, come on. The struggle to rally black America is on once again. But gone are the blatant issues of segregation and discrimination. From their pulpits today, ministers are attempting to arouse their captive audiences around more complex issues such as inflation and recession and their threat to the country's 26 million blacks. Didn't I just tell you that we're inextricably bound together? And not only that, let me tell you this. 
When America has a recession, black folks have a depression. When America has a bad cold, black folks have pneumonia. When America has indigestion, black folks have convulsions. Three years ago, black leaders from the South convinced the masses to support a Southern candidate for president. 90% of the blacks who went to the polls in 76 cast ballots for Jimmy Carter, a major reason for his election. Today, the polls show that the majority of Americans have little confidence in the president, and the majority of blacks may boycott the 1980 elections. When black people went to the polls, they voted for Jimmy Carter. And I said in 1976, and say again, that the great mistake that black folks made was to elect Jimmy Carter and then go home and say, I hope that he does the right thing. That is not a reality-oriented approach to politics. What we should have said in 1976 was that we will give you our vote in turn for public commitments on critical issues that affect our lives, both in terms of domestic issues and in terms of foreign policy. And the degree to which you don't live up to those commitments, we will make your life miserable in the following four years, and we will make it virtually impossible for you to get reelected in the next four. My point is, is that in many ways we have not been realistic in, in terms of our involvement in politics, and we have not really clearly and fully understood the significant power of the black vote in this country. All of us sitting here are Democrats. And uh, it seems to be a foregone conclusion whenever we have these kinds of discussions that we're assuming that we're talking only about the Democratic Party. I think one way to, to rid ourselves of the large degree of voter apathy that we have is for some of our people who perhaps aren't voting as Democrats because they don't agree with our platform, some black people, that they might decide to go into other parties. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a two-party system within the black community. And I think there would certainly be a stimulant. And not only would it be for party votes and what have you, but it would be to have more people to get the kinds of platforms that we're talking about. We'd have a choice for the first time in a number of years, since 1936, I believe, of who we wanted to vote for. And certainly with that kind of choice, your voter participation is going to be stimulated. Now, I'm not advocating every black to run out and vote on a Republican ticket. I'm not going to do it myself. But I do think that that would stimulate the sort of value that you're trying to get at here. Mr. Uh, Mitchell? I agree we need a two-party system, maybe a three-party system, maybe a four-party system. But I will go right on record now saying that there's no way in hell that blacks are going to move into the Republican Party for as long as it's dominated by that conservative Reagan type. It's not, just not going to happen. Given the fact that blacks fought so hard and died in some cases uh, to get things such as the Voting Rights Act of 1965, how do you explain, if you can, the fact that the majority of blacks are still not participating in the political process, are not voting. We have a failed system, and one of the indications of it is that uh, the electoral process is not producing any satisfactory result, not to anybody, uh, more especially to black people, and even more particularly to young black people. Uh, we have an unemployment rate that's double everybody else's. Uh, we have a, a really uh, quite a desperate situation for many people now with degrees who we see on the Hill uh, ending up in rather menial tasks. We have a, a system whose electoral politics uh, have failed. We've been disappointed in 1976. Uh, we're going into another quadrennial no-choice situation between keeping somebody in that we're all disgusted with or taking a chance on somebody new that may not really form any difference. And this is the political history of black people in the 20th century. So uh, I am not surprised to find this ingredient. Now, one closing point from myself. Uh, I still feel that I have to fight this apathy. I, I don't say that because it's understandable it should be ignored or rationalized. I believe that everybody should participate in the process to the extent that we can and fight to change it. Very often, blacks have struggled very hard to elect black officials. And there is an amazing tendency on the part of some black officials, once they're in office, to divorce themselves from the masses of people. They're simply not accessible. And I think we have to look at that quite honestly and realistically. I think a second factor, uh, which gives me some concern, is the kind of politics of despair that's talked all the time. 
nothing's worked, there's been no change, there never will be any change. I think a politics of despair is easy to sell, uh, but it results in a kind of nihilistic thinking, nothingness. And we, maybe we need to look at that. The third uh, area that I would think about, and uh, I think John and Ron have both touched on it, I would venture to say that there has been no significant change in the masses of black people in their lives over the last 10 years. A few elite people have gotten some things, and there's nothing wrong with elitism. I can live with that. But I, I think the guy who's struggling just to survive, who has participated in voting before, and still sees himself out of a job, with no decent home, with no real prospects for the future, is going to be apathetic. Uh, what's the role of the black middle class in all of this we're talking about? The professionals, doctors, lawyers. Middle classness in 1979 simply means that you have a, a job that's capable of allowing you to get yourself in incredible debt. And most American people are poor. They are members of the debt poverty stricken society. But even those blacks who are part of debt poverty, of what you refer to as middle class, what is their responsibility? It's to understand that for every one, quote, black middle class person, there are nine who never made it through that door. And it seems to me that our responsibility is to keep that door open, to change the nature of the action. The politics of the 1980s are the politics that deal with the problems and the misery and the victimization of the masses of people. And if the politics of the 1980s do not address that issue, we're in trouble. The black middle class notwithstanding, the majority of black blacks in this country have fallen further behind in this country over the past 20 years. We have not significantly improved. The, 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 the issues are very complicated. The degree to which black middle class people walk away from that struggle is the degree to which they're abdicating their responsibility. Somebody died for every single one of us in this room and out there in the countryside to be in the, quote, middle class class position of being able to be debt poor. I have seen, in personal opinion, a widening gap between uh, the masses who have not become a part of the mainstream, uh, the have not, so to speak, and the blacks who are convinced that they have made it. Has anybody here experienced that? But don't you that have that you? same thing among the whites? The Appalachian whites do not relate to the whites that live on Wall, that operate on Wall Street. The whites who live in the mining camps don't operate with the same kind of efficiency and the kind of respect that you get operating from the White House. You always have people that way. And I do not, I do not criticize the black brother for trying to pull his brother up rather than to go and get in the ditch and laying down there with him. But he should stay with him and hold his hand. And, and, and I think if, we, if we're going to criticize the brother for that, then I think we're on the wrong road. May I just make one comment? I think what you're alluding to, particularly given the economics uh, and, and, uh, of this country and the complicated nature of the economics and how they fall heavily on uh, people, the point simply is that we're moving toward a point in time where we may very well face in this country a conflict, a challenge. And it will not necessarily be along racial lines. I think that it will be along economic lines. And it would be a have versus the have not situation. Right. There are millions of blacks and non blacks in this country who are realizing the gap that is transpiring between them. And the tragedy is that when you begin to talk about the class struggle, the interesting thing is that blacks will end up on both sides of that question. There will be some blacks fighting as hard to maintain the status quo of corporate power and multinational corporate control and domination of policy in this country as any other white person because they have benefited from it. You and I know very specific examples of organizations coming forward with policies of statement that flew in the face of the best interests of the masses of people in this country but not flow, flying in the face of corporate interests in this country. And so as we begin to become part of this society, a part of us, the tragedy has been that we have placed blacks in many of these high positions on corporate boards and other things in order to advance the plight and the misery of black people, but many of them went there and identified with the system. And that's what you're talking about. I think that all these issues that have been raised are extremely important, something that all black people have to think about. I do think, however, that there's a great there's a great void when it does come down to the black uh, apathy at the polls and so forth. I think, however, that uh, in order to have clear-cut choices that Ron has mentioned, 
and all of us here have mentioned, you do have to have a system that is going to encourage all people to vote. Now, just as you mentioned that we've had voter apathy in the black community, I think statistics will bear out the fact that you have that same apathy in the other communities as well. And I think it's a matter of the, it's a, it's a, it's a problem of the entire electoral process, and it's a, it's a problem of the, the moral and the dedication to our country and perhaps the patriotism to our country that we're, we're, we're missing today. I think that in times of great stress, armed conflict, the, vote, the voter uh, scale always goes up. When we're at times of peace and there is no reason to bring out the patriotic feelings, the voter scale goes down. I think this is something that is common to all ethnic groups. I think it is something that blacks, because we have so much at stake through the electoral process, should look at very seriously. If we can assume that uh, most of the black politicians are first-generation politicians, you've got a lot to learn, the black leaders in this country, about the political process. We know enough. The question now is, will we become active in that regard and be much more forceful in the body politic? Uh, the body politic is not irrelevant. Every single day, the United States Congress, the president, makes decisions that affect our lives in an incredible way. Black folks have not stood up and challenged the military budget as a community. We have not stood up as a community and forced foreign policy calculations on the part of this country in an extraordinary way. We have not, as a group, stood up and demanded that every person running for the president, the Senate, the Congress of the United States address themselves to the critical issues of our time. But how do you get the masses of blacks to participate in the political process? Voter apathy has to be the major challenge confronting black leaders today. But perhaps they can begin by stop making excuses for why blacks don't vote. Perhaps they should educate the masses as to the rewards and punishments of the political process. Since the Voting Rights Act became law back in 1965, there's been only one full-time voter education program in this country targeted to blacks. And it's located exclusively in the South. I think what we have to understand about the 60s and now the 80s is what the poet said, and that is that new occasions teach new duties. And I think that the problems that we are confronted with today are so intransigent, so intractable, so deep, that I'm not sure that they can be met by another march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I think that the greatest, most effective demonstration black people can make is a march to the voting booth. That is probably the most effective demonstration, nonviolent protestation we can make. white man was satisfied at one point that the black was satisfied with his condition. Now he knows that uh, the black man is not. You were saying that you're concerned that a lot of black people can't pull together. I care what you try to do. Regardless to how it benefit and regardless to how it does. They just won't, just won't be concerned with one another. You gonna vote today? Uh, vote. Vote. Vote for who? Think it's important? Could be. You're not that concerned about it? Not really, because I don't know that much about it. Black people, in my opinion, are still shackled with the mentality of the slave, slave master. The only person I really have faith in right now is me. Didn't I just tell you that we're inextricably bound together? Unless we do it in Cambridge, unless we do it in Baltimore, Washington, all over the country, I think we're in trouble as blacks.